Hey everyone, welcome to the inaugural episode of 143 TV Book Club. I'm your host, Adam Sarah. And for our first episode, we have Mary Reagan. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. And you, Adam, thank you for inviting me onto the show. No problem. We're glad to have you on our first episode. Thank you. Now, we're here to discuss your very first book today, which is called Life Flashes. But before we get into that, let's talk about you as an author. Let's talk about your author, author journey for a second. So how did you uh, get into writing books? Well, I, I didn't intend to write a book. I began writing a journal after a, an experience that I underwent, a, a profound spiritual experience I went. I started writing a journal in 2007. And then in 10, 2010, I thought, oh, I think this is a book. I think I'm going to continue, continue on with it until it's finished. Had I known then that it was going to be another 11 years before I finished it, I might not have finished it. But I'm glad I did. It was a work of passion. Nice. So what were some of the challenges you uh, faced during that 11-year uh, window of uh, writing this book? What kind of challenges are you talking about? So, for um, for example, like you know, I'm trying, like when I, I like write a book, I think mm -hmm. things of that nature. Sometimes it's hard to get in the mood, get in the right, um, you know, atmosphere about writing the book, or writing like chapters down, or writing just writing anything. Um, like, what was uh, your writing process like? Okay, well, I'm glad you clarified that because now. Yeah, I understand where you're, where you're going. And that's a good question because when I started writing, I was a little bit um, nervous about doing it correctly. And then all of a sudden I said, you're, you're going about the more nervous I get, the more it wouldn't go the way I hoped it would. But long story short, being, an art, being a writer is a lot like being an artist. And the important thing to do is just throw it up there, throw it on the paper with pen do it with a sense of authenticity, with respect, and compassion for the people, places, and things that you write about. And um, everything will fall into place from there. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I, um, as I grew as a writer, I learned the, the job of a writer is to say as much as possible and be as brief as possible. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that I learned that I was inspired to do that was, first of all, for example, um, by not always referring to self as I. I would refer to self often in the third person. And so that, uh, to, to give the work a sense of balance. And another, another, another technique that I used was I didn't use uh, prepositions a lot. And what I found, for example, um, and, and I found not using prepositions. I'm, I'm wanting to think of an example, a quick example that I could use. Um, but not using them actually enables you to connect things more quickly because there's a reaction that goes on in your brain when the to, to the um, bookstore isn't there that you automatically connect it without the preposition. Um, so I found that out and I found that was, uh, I found it helpful to say, again, to continually think of ways to, um, to, to write effectively with as few words as possible. I mean, na even now, like when I, I don't, I, I'll, I'll often start a sentence with am, I don't start it with I, um, and things of this nature. I'm wanting to think of, uh, in another thing that I did was, for example, in, I used a technique in which I animated, I animated people, places, and things by, by omitting an article. For example, I wrote a story about a truck driver who almost, um, almost, almost hit and killed Doug Jura, but fortunately he swerved out of the way and putting himself at great risk, um, he swerved out of the way Jura, the life was, of Jura was saved. He wasn't hurt. But anyway, as the story goes along, I identify him as not as the truck driver in small, mm -hmm. in lowercase letters. I call him truck driver, so that animates him. Um, I'm, we met a Jura and I met a deer in the woods one time. And instead of calling him the deer, 
I call them handsome deer. So it, uh, it's, I think it's something that like comes from, that came to me from, it's a Indian language, American Indian language. They would use terms like that. Yes, I remember, uh, especially in the beginning of your book, you describe how you're creating kind of new rules about how mm -hmm. to how to mm -hmm. read this book, which is really cool. Thank um, you. What, you know, you kind of just touched on how yeah. why you came from it, um, like American Indian style. Mm -hmm. um, but is there any other like inspiration on why you chose to like kind of like rearrange the rules a bit for this book? Well, uh, one other thing that I did was I chose to. <clears throat> Uh, well, I don't know if I chose it, but I believe, I believe the diary form was chosen for me. And then I grew to love it. And I, when I initially, when I pitched it to agents, they wanted me to, a number of agents, they wanted me to turn it into a narrative. And I, I couldn't do it. It was too much a part of my heart, the diary form. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why is because the diary form enables you to look directly at what's going on with your new heart and soul mm -hmm. and one of the beauties of the diary form is that when you read it when you finish one entry you go on to a new subject and so you don't have to remember well who was that where were they that's over yeah you go it puts you right into the present and um you just mentioned about it getting published now mm -hmm. it was a little was it, was it hard getting this book published for your first book like what was that process mm -hmm. like as like someone is a new, like someone's watching it, maybe be a new author or trying to get into it. Like, what was that journey like getting this book published? Uh, well, I decided that um, it's at one point, I decided that I wanted to go with an independent publisher. And yeah, it's, it's been a journey. I was with an independent publisher um, and we published the first edition in 2001. And then a year later, I decided um, that I wanted to move on and I went to another publisher and we decided to reformat the book, redo the cover. And then at one point, uh, at one point we was, it was um, initially Amazon said that they w wouldn't publish the second edition. So mm -hmm. I was devastated. I thought, I wrote this book. What do you mean? Mm. But to be fair with Amazon, Amazon mm. has been going through, um, I suspect that they, they have been experiencing situations where people are writing second edition, or even first editions, and they're not authentic. Mm. So they made it very difficult for me to do it. So they said no to me. And so then we went to another, um, we went to another publisher. And there was a glitch with the other publisher too. So, but we, we persevered. Um, we thought it was, it was released in late October of 2023. We thought it was going to be released like possibly in June. Mm -hmm. So because of that issue, it was a delay. But I just, I, I firmly believe that everything, things happen for a reason, whether you like them or you don't like them and you learn to, you just find ways to persevere. Yeah, that was my next, my next question was yeah. like persevering, persevering through like all those roadblocks. Mm -hmm. So that would be kind of the advice you give to like an aspiring author or writer is just mm -hmm. to like, if you love it, just to like keep going and, you know, eventually you'll you know, like find your publisher. You will. And, and to and also to just to look at the setbacks I've learned to look at the setbacks as opportunities for growth, mm -hmm. which I might not have, you know, in earlier years in life, I might not have and it might have held me back but now i just and i know that no situation is essentially in these hands mm. it's a relief and i trust the one whose hands it's in and so yeah i've 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 learned to learn to joyfully persevere because i realize i've been there have been many times when i've given up in in life and persevering is a lot more worthwhile and I'm becoming, you know, I don't stress as much as I used to because, frankly, stress is a lot of work. Yeah, you get really overworked, is. you get drained out. It's like, I'm lazy. I don't want to do that much work. Yeah. No. So, <laughs> so I don't stress as much anymore. It's a, yeah, it's a gift. Nice. Before we get dive right, right into your book, I want to talk about uh, the cover for a second. Mm -hmm. What was the inspiration for this? I see we have a, a good old boy right here. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so what what's going on here? Well, that was, it's a, it's a cover that um, it was redesigned and I had zero to do with it <laughs> because I can't, I can write, I can't draw to save 
yeah. uh, my life. But um, that is a um, silhouette of me with Dog Jorah. And I, that was in that, this part of it. I, I liked, maybe we, it's good for us to talk a little bit about the name Life Flashes, uh, because I, um, I was, it was uh, decided when I was sitting in a hairdresser chair one day, this, I, was, this, I was figuring out mm. names for the, for the, and she said, well, okay, what do you, you know, let, let's hear it. So I said, the first one was um, remembering. She looks at me like, uh, what else? <laughs> no one's going to buy that book. What else? <laughs> so then I, I said, um, either flash life or life flashes. And she said, I like life flashes. And that's it. That's what it's going to be. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, all right. So when, so when we like open this book up, uh, it's diary, like kind of entry is in base. Like, so what were, what's some, what are some of your favorite, uh, moments from this book that you kind of like want if you like if you told someone about it what would really get them to you know read it or like um well one of it's not um yeah one of the, i've been doing some book signings and author talks and i went to that to me that's the icing on the cake mm. is meeting readers yeah and people who are you know interested in the book and i went to um barnes and nobles in dedham um a few weeks ago and a little boy came up to me, he's 12 years old. And he said, um, he was there with his grandparents and his sister. And he wants to be a doctor when he's, when he grows up because he's, his sister has ear, ear problems and he wants to help her. Mm -hmm. I just thought, oh, how, how sweet. And anyway, so he came up to me, he said, I looked up your book on Amazon and I really liked the cover and I also, I like the book description. So I thought, you know what? I decided this would be a good book, not only for my mother to read, but for me to read. I nearly passed out. <laughs> I nearly passed out. Um, it, I mean, that's yeah. an irreplaceable moment, you know? And then there was a, a woman who bought the book for her. Uh, she bought the book for a friend of hers who was very ill. And she, and she bought a book for herself, for self. And then there was a guy came up to me and I said, uh, I said, do you, do you like memoir? He said, no, I don't. I said, well, wh what do you, what would you think about just reading the first page of the first chapter of this book? So he said, I'll do that. So he reads it. He looks at me and he says, this is very dark. I said, it is. Turn the page. It's going to lighten up real quick. <laughs> so he turns the page. He reads it. He says, I'm going to buy the book. Nice. So, yeah, it was, it was, um, and then I last, I went to, um, another book signing in Walpole at Barnes and Nobles, um, last weekend. And there was a woman there that I met there who's going to, um, Auschwitz in October. I yeah. said, Oh my gosh, God bless you. I couldn't do that. Yeah. And she says, you know, I know how you feel. I feel a little bit nervous about it too, but it's, it's history. And I said, yeah, I said, well, I can't, I don't have the courage to go there with you, but not that she would ask me, <laughs> but when she comes back, we, we might, uh, you know, drink a cup of tea together and talk about it. It's just, I love the connections. It's just really fascinating. So for someone that's like just picking up your book and like, what are, are for our viewers, mm -hmm. what was that? What's that first page? Like that, you know, the basically that told the guy that was like, it's so dark, but like grabbed him. So what can you like summarize that first page for us? Really? Sure. I was, um, at the time I was not well, I hadn't been well for a number of years mm -hmm. and I was not sure. I was generally sure I, I couldn't go on much longer. Mm -hmm. So I went outside where I was living and I was at, at five in the morning. Mm -hmm. I'm very lightly dressed. I'm walking down a sidewalk and I'm thinking I, I can't, I can't go on this much longer. And I didn't realize of this until recently, but all of a sudden I said, no, I don't. And I believe that was the first time that I was asked by God, do you want your life to end this way? And I said, no, I don't. And I couldn't hold a job. Relationships were difficult for me. I was financially insecure and had been for a long time. So that's, that's what brought me to where I was. And so 
um, I started a conversation with, with God and I just talked about why I had been so discouraged for a number of years and things that I had done wrong, things that I didn't feel that were forgiven. Mm -hmm. And I, all of a sudden I heard a voice say, I forgave you for these things years ago. So I was overcome. And I remember I started walking up onto um, High Street, High Street in Hingham. And I said, God, well, thank you, Lord, but I just don't know how to go forward. I don't know how to hold a job. Relationships are difficult for me. Finance is hard for me. And I felt in the middle of the darkness of early morning light, I felt a hand, spiritual hand reached down to me. It was composed of bright white light. And it said, come with me. I will show you how to live again. And the rest of the book is like that? No, so, no, oh. no, it isn't. Okay. But let me just say that on that day, that experience was so powerful that I went off the antidepressant meds I had been prescribed for two years on that day, and I haven't ever been on them, and I have no interest in ever being on them again. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, the thing is when you reignite a relationship with with divinity or God, um, you know that the confidence isn't coming from mm. some medicine. Yeah. It, it doesn't anyway, because what I found with the medicine is that it was, it just subdues your symptoms and it, it you know, it, it leaves you leaving rather lethargic. So you don't want to exercise, which is crucial mm. to, you know, mental and physical health. So um, anyway, but uh, I think one of the things that first comes back is your your passion for living. You can be just as happy taking out the fresh as you can be doing an interview. Mm -hmm. And so what, it, um, I got, what I was being taught is that life isn't about what size house you live in, mm -hmm. um, who you're socializing with, or whether you're so, how much of a a socializer you are, um, what, what's your income, none of those things, these are all accidents, so to speak. What life is about is about who you are inside. And, you, and only faith can teach you how to be content no matter what your circumstances are. And I've been learning that and I find it a joy to, um, a wonder and a joy to be able to be content and share that contentment with others no matter what circumstances a person is facing. We can we can do that, but you can only do it with a relationship. With I, I did it with depending on me. Ugh. <laughs> I don't want to go there again. And when I do go there, it's always um, I, I learn. I can't. I can't. And you know what's really been surprising to me too is that I've learned more to depend on divinity, mm -hmm. transcendence, um, God. However, one experiences these things, as I have become. It has enabled me, it's teaching me how to be fully independent. Whereas before, in younger years, I'd be like, God, I don't want anything to do with religion. I don't, I'm, I'm good, mm -hmm. I don't, you know. And the more I um, pushed away dependence on God, the more paralyzed I became. Just the opposite now. And the and the rest of the book was kind of like uh, your diary of journey going. Uh... Yeah, going forward. I didn't really, I didn't have any plan for it. Um, I just walked forward and started, you know, recording differing experience. And I believe that I was led to every experience that was in the book. And, you know, um, I, it led me to interactions with national, um, national figures. A lot of the national figures I, I met at um, JFK library and I was a little bit nervous about putting, I said, you don't know these people. I'll put them in the book, <laughs> you know? And then I thought it doesn't matter whether you know these people. What was said to me is, if you can bring something to light about their personality mm. that people don't know, then that's they'll read it. And one, of, for example, um, the night before former President Jimmy Carter was elected, he was mopping the basement floor of his home in Georgia. Yeah, you know. So it just, um, and I, I also, I mean, I remember, I remember seeing him um, signing the camp. David Accords with um, in the late 70s with 
former um, Isra Israeli President Menachem Begin and former Egyptian President Anwar Sadat. He's in a, a Middle East pe peace agreement. And, and they were at the White House. He had helped them to, you know, cooperate in the agreement. And I just, I looked into his eyes and I thought, you know what, he's a good man. And that's really what life is. I want, you know, he's, he's a person of faith, even though I didn't fully understand what that meant. And I just said, you know, I, I, that's who I want to be. It's not about who you are or what your position is. It's who you are inside. And, I mean, I met a number of, um, I also met a number of people at, um, that I probably wouldn't have met. For example, former Governor Charlie Baker. I met him at, um, I met former First Lady Rosalind Carter, the late uh, mm. First Lady Rosalind Carter. Um, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. Um, and she was growing up at about the same time mm. that I was growing yeah. up, too. And um, she said that, you know, she said that she, at one point, she said she hadn't ever considered herself, she, that she had experienced segregation, but she hadn't ever ex, um, experienced or identified herself solely as a victim. And I was, and I was like, whoa. Uh, and I thought, you know, why? And she said, because when you identify yourself as a victim of anything, you become aggrieved, you, you develop an attitude of entitlement and aggrievement. And when you identify yourself essentially as a victim, you lose confidence. And I thought, perfect. That's why she, you know, she evolved to the level that she evolves, because she doesn't see herself as a victim. Hmm. Yeah. So where can people find this book? Where like where can people get it? If uh, there's a website, yeah, we'll put a put a link down here. Well, not a link. We'll put a website down here because oh, this cool. is on TV oh, cool. now. Cool. But, so where can people grab this um, book? The, it's you can yep you can order directly from the website. Thank you. And the website name is um, maryhreagan.com. Mm -hmm. um, it's also at Barnes and Noble's bookstores. It's at Buttonwood a Bookstore in Cohasset. And um, I'm hoping to bring it to as many places as I can. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, Mary, thank you for joining us today on yeah, our first episode of 143 TV Books. Thank you. And I'm your host, Adam Sierra. We hope to see you soon next time. Mm -hmm.